Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. And God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. Welcome to another edition of the Q Ideas Podcast. I'm Gabe Lyons, and every week we're trying to bring you the most relevant, important topics and understanding so that you can go forward and navigate the complexities of the world that we live in. But you can do it with confidence. You can do it faithfully. What I love about the work that we try to do is help bring together not just a faith perspective, but we pair that with science. We pair it with social science. We try to understand what is happening in the world and what does faith have to say to it. It's my belief that every single issue happening in the world today, the Christian ought to have a voice into that. We have something to offer. We can best understand what has God designed for human beings? How has he designed us to flourish, to function best? And when we get a little bit off from that, we start to see results. We start to see things that that start to break apart. We start to see corruption. We start to see things fall apart. And part of the Christian role in this is to bring about shalom, to try to bring people together, to bring peace to our communities. And that touches every kind of issue you could imagine. Now, today's conversation takes on a a little more of a sad space for all of us that we've had to experience over these last many years. And it's the understanding that suicidal thoughts has been rising and rising quickly, especially among the next generation. We already knew that we had a challenge with something called deaths of despair. We've talked about that multiple talks that we've had on the Q Ideas platform, describing the challenges of depression, of middle age despair, and how that can lead to suicide. But today we turn our attention to a new generation. We look at the youngest amongst us and how suicide is becoming more of a trend. It's becoming a much more acceptable option for children, for teenagers, for young adults as they look to their future with despair. And what do we do about it? How do we better understand what is taking place within that space? What is making this become such a reality for so many? And how can we as the church, how can we as parents, how can we as friends be more aware and understand all of the dynamics that lead up to the trend of suicide? Now, to help us do that today is Dr. Brooke Keel. She serves as Executive Director of Counseling Services for Mercy Multiplied. Now, this organization's amazing. The work that they do to help young women come into homes and come into spaces. They have multiple spaces and residences around the country where women can come from the age of 13 all the way into their 30s who are dealing with suicidal thoughts, dealing with depression, cutting, food addiction, anorexia, you name it, eating disorders of of all types. And they can find a home and a space and a community to process that, to seek the healing that they need as they try to put their lives back together and try to work through the trauma that they're dealing with. Dr. Brooke Keels oversees this, and she has done an incredible job of leading Mercy Multiplied. As a licensed professional counselor with 10 years of experience in counseling program design and counseling supervision, Brooke has worked in various settings, and there couldn't be a more important moment for a leader like Brooke to help us better understand how to navigate this within our own community. So let's listen in now. Every single one of us has thought about ending our lives. Every one of us has been so overwhelmed or been so fearful or so broken that we've thought, I can't do this anymore. I can't feel this way anymore and I can't be here anymore. Now for those of you who are like, I don't know what she's talking about, I've never felt that way. That is amazing. You are a better person than all of us. You could also be completely delusional, but I will let you figure out which camp that you land in there, okay? But for everyone else that has been there and said, I am done. Now for some of us, when we have that thought, I'm done, it kind of jolts us. We go, oh, wait a second. I don't know that I'm that done, right? Let me see what I can figure out. We figure out how to re-engage no matter how we feel about the situation, even if it feels hopeless. But for a lot of other people, once they have the thought, I'm done, they begin to think, how can I actually be done? 
They, no long, they begin to fantasize about no longer having to feel what they're feeling or experience life in the way that they're experiencing it if they weren't living. We are losing 123 people a day to suicide in the US. And ending your own life has become the second leading cause of death for children ages 10 through 24. We had a 35% increase in suicide from 1999 to 2018. And what I wanna propose to you today is that how we are responding to those who maybe don't wanna live anymore is actually not really that helpful. And I'm gonna share what I believe we can do to change our response and draw people back in. Now, before we go much further, I do wanna explain this, okay? There is a difference between someone being actively suicidal and having passive suicidal ideation. Someone who is actively suicidal, they have a plan and they want to kill themselves. Someone who is passively dealing with suicidal ideation, they don't know that they really wanna exist anymore, but they don't have a plan or maybe the drive to actually follow through with it. And so for our purposes today, I am talking about those that are struggling with passive suicidal ideation. Because if we can reach people here, we can actually shift the suicide trend. Recently, I was working with a young woman who was struggling with suicidal thoughts. She wasn't actively suicidal, but she considered the idea of not existing anymore daily. At one point she said, I don't know if ending my life is really wrong. Is it wrong or is this just something that Western culture, Western Christianity has told me is wrong? Why isn't it okay for me to not live anymore? And see, the logical fallacy in her question is that it isn't about right and wrong. We can't make suicide legalistic, right? The old tactics don't work. The fear of going to hell, the what will your family think or do, they'll be so sad, right? Or my very favorite, where we tell someone who's in a really bad place, don't worry, someone else has it worse than you and that should make you feel better, right? <laughs> now, why don't these work? because I'll tell you what we're hearing. What we are hearing is, I don't really know that I think I would go to hell if I ended my life. I don't really know that I think it's wrong. And I think if we could just collectively agree right here to stop telling someone that they shouldn't feel bad because someone else is in a bad, worse place, we'd just be better off for humanity, right? Good, a lot of nods, that's good. What we're also seeing is that even if someone doesn't necessarily want to commit suicide, the idea of having that as an option is comforting. If things get too disappointing, I can just choose to end my life. Now, I was talking to the same young woman and what she said to me was, if I take suicide off the table, then life becomes a prison sentence. The option of suicide has not only become comforting, it has now become the ultimate form of control and a viable option for life that feels like prison. Someone who has chosen to believe this no longer feels engaged, they don't feel like they belong, and they don't feel known. And you cannot convince someone otherwise with the most well-crafted of arguments that they should feel differently. The American Enterprise Institute conducted a study on social capital and loneliness indicators, and they found that being social and meeting with people doesn't actually mean people feel connected. In fact, 57% of Americans feel as though they are around people, but not really with them. And this research shows that the biggest indicator actually of connectedness is that someone is a member of a committed group. Being known and knowing others. We are made to belong in a committed community. Now I have the privilege of being a, seeing a committed community work every day, right? One of the most amazing things about working for an organization like Mercy Multiplied is that I get to see what happens when you provide the space for people to be hurt, to be angry, and to be sad. And they are met with love and stability and compassion. I have seen lives restored because our staff are willing to sit in someone's pain for the long term and then lead them to the healer. But mercy is an organization, right? So how do we as individuals help people engage and no longer feel as if life is a prison sentence? Well, for one, we have to actually be present with people. 
Now, when I say that, most people go, well, sure. If someone doesn't wanna live anymore, I'll definitely be present with them. But generally, that's not actually the response. Generally, when you hear someone say, I don't know that I wanna live anymore, we become afraid and we begin operating out of fear, right? We respond to them as if, oh no, they must be actively suicidal and they need to be rescued. And the problem with responding this way first is that we actually isolate the person more because you cannot meet someone's need when you are operating out of fear, right? We begin to question everything we say, trying to say the perfect thing that will help them no longer feel that way and also ease our fear. And I am not saying that there are not moments to rescue. What I'm saying is that more often than not, when someone is saying, I am done, this is where we can choose to be steady. Steadiness responds with, okay, I hear you. I hear that you don't wanna do this anymore. And it steps forward and it engages and it's in for the long haul. When we are present with people, when we are not attempting to be their counselor, not just randomly checking in and not treating them as this broken person who has thoughts that need to be feared, we are pulling them out of constantly examining their sadness or the depravity of their situation and we are shifting their thoughts to one of connection and belonging. Instead of disqualifying their hurts and hopes and trying to make it okay, right? We can sit with them in their pain and show them how to grieve and be grateful at the same time. Our job as a committed member of an engaged community is to be healthy enough that we can walk alongside someone who is desperate for connection and connect them to the resources that they need. Let them know that you see them, that you hear them, that you see that they are hurt and that you're not going anywhere. We have to be that place where we mean what we say because we consistently show up and we consistently reach out to connect. Our best response to the suicide trend is to gently and consistently be present with others. Thank you. Well, I hope hearing this uh, helped you better understand and get insight into what we need to be doing in our community, what it means for us to truly be present with others. And the work that Brooke does with so many people, so many families, so many women ages 13 to 32 who are dealing with anxiety or depression, abuse, eating disorder, self-harm, unplanned pregnancy, I mean, even sex trafficking. The work that Mercy Multiplied does is amazing. And I want you to check out their work at mercymultiplied.com. Maybe this is for you. Maybe you have a daughter. Maybe you have a friend or parents that are walking through this with their child, and they need to hear this today. They need to know that there's hope. They need to know there's even organizations that help children walk through these things even in a residential setting. And that is the opportunity you have with Mercy Multiplied. Their donors help support it. It's affordable because they're trying to underwrite the whole experience for children who need to walk through a healing journey. And so check them out. What an incredible gift to the body of Christ. And so we're grateful for Dr. Brooke Keels. We're also grateful for Nancy Alcorn, who helped found this incredible ministry uh, that continues to grow around this country. And I couldn't imagine a more important time for an organization like this to exist. So learn more about them. And then also, if you want to see this talk, or you want to share it, or you want to watch the hundreds of other talks that we've been curating over the last couple of years, you can do that at qideas.org slash trial, which will give you 30 days access to our Q Media platform, which for $7.99 a month allows you to see thousands of talks, podcast episodes, so many different conversations that we are creating to equip you as a leader, as a parent, as an entrepreneur, as a person who's called into certain spaces to lead, to confidently move forward and take your faith into every conversation that you are leading. And so we hope that we can partner with you in that way and you can get access for 30 days at qideas.org slash trial. Well, until next week, we hope this encourages you and that you can share it with somebody that would encourage them, with a family member or a friend, and we can continue to partner together to help people flourish. 